How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 in Pacific, 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zarian, and it is Wednesday here on the show. You know what that means? Tonight is AW Dynamite. We finally got a bunch of stuff advertised for the show. Three brand new segments added today, bringing us to six. And obviously the big thing is they're advertising that Sting makes his final Dynamite appearance before retirement. We will see him again. But he will not be a regular. But we will see Sting again. We'll go over the full lineup for that show. We also got matches announced for Rampage on Friday. We've got a SmackDown lineup. Revolution is this coming Sunday. And, unfortunately, we must open with the passing of Mike Jones. Virgil has passed away. News of his passing announced by referee Mark Charles III, who noted Jones passed away peacefully this morning at a hospital, 61 years old. My dear friends, he wrote, It is with a great sorrow I bring news from the Jones family of the passing of our beloved Michael Jones, whom we know and loved as Virgil, Vincent, Soul Train Jones, and more. Passed away peacefully at the hospital this morning. I ask that you pray for him and his family. May his memory be eternal. Perhaps best known as Ted DiBiase's bodyguard Virgil, late 80s, early 90s. Eventually he would turn on DiBiase after years of abuse. Feud culminated in him winning the Million Dollar Championship at SummerSlam 91. Before signing with WWE, he wrestled as Soul Train Jones, once held the AWA Southern Tag Team titles with Rocky Johnson, ended up in WCW, part of the NWO, renamed Vincent, playing up on rumors that the name Virgil had been a rib on Dusty Rhodes' real name. We're going to talk more about Virgil after the break and tons of news today. Back in a moment, Observer Live. There's one, two. Now he's got Brian Alvarez. He whips him into the corner hard. Adam Firestorm following up, catches a boot to the face. Brian out. Brian Alvarez with another hard shot to the head. One, two. This is the most aggressive I've seen Brian Alvarez today here in Portland Wrestling. Now he's got his knee across the throat. He's joking him, LC. Well, it's like this week Alvarez has something to prove, brother. Something to prove to his sweet little lady over there. Of course, Adam Firestone with a big win over Black Dragon last week. Looking for another one here. There's a sunset flip. Is he going to go down? Yes, he is. Over he goes. One, two, three. It is all over. Adam Firestorm with the victory over beautiful Brian Alvarez here in Portland Wrestling. Now out Brian Alvarez firing away with a boot. Action continues after the bell. Goes for the back body drop. No! Face first plant by Adam Firestorm. Your winner once. Looks like he'll be your winner twice. Action continues. There's a whip into the far corner. Adam Firestorm follows with a spinning kick. Elsie, I think Brian Alvarez has bit off more than he could chew tonight. Miss to own really disgusted over in the corner. Adam Firestorm not done. There's a lion sold on top. He hooks again. One, two. Two and a half. I thought we had a three count earlier in this match, LC. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I can't sorry. believe it. I thought you thought Wild was just adding a little salt to the wound. I thought Alvarez was out of her ass and a two-time loser, brother. Well, Mark Watson's hand must have stopped just short of the three count. And these eyes of my need glasses because I thought I saw a three count. Brian Alvarez going up top. Oh, we'll forget about your cataracts, brother. Up and up he goes. Nobody but home. Adam Firestorm back in control, playing a bit of possum. He's climbing up top as Rento and Otto really upset. There he goes. Swap, oh, oh, that one yet. Here's a hook to leg. One, two, three. Now it's all over. A two-time loser. And does the LC have to look after Miss Rento and Otto tonight, baby? There's Adam Firestorm, your winner in this match. Once, twice, three times, it didn't matter. Brian Alvarez not up to it. Miss Rinto Onato absolutely disgusted with it. Mark Watson explaining to him it was a three count this time. No hook the leg. Fair and square, Adam Firestone. Your winner here on Portland Wrestling. Fans will be right back with a, after a message from our sponsors.
Show. Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Yes, Virgil passed away. And it notes here, best known for his run as Ted DiBiase's bodyguard Virgil in the late 80s, early 90s. That, that would have been his, his most famous run. But I will say that when I, when I think of Virgil, Mike Jones, the one thing that sticks out to me more than anything else is, man, could that guy hustle. I mean... <laughs> Exactly. Boy, was he... It, when it comes to, like, being able to hustle... Because here's the thing. Wrestling superstar Virgil. Everybody... Everybody who was a star in that mid to late 80s WWF period, like, I mean, they were a star. Even if they weren't Hulk Hogan. You know, Honky Tonk Man and... You know, like, all those guys. Like, everybody knew those guys if you were a wrestling fan. And Virgil was not like a big star. He was he was DiBiase's bodyguard. Everybody knew him, but you know it wasn't like he was a contender for the title or anything like that. He was a bodyguard, and then he split away, which was a big angle. And then he went off on his own, and he really didn't do much really on his own. And then you know, of course, later he ended up going to uh, to WCW. And it was like the same thing. Like, he was there. He was a guy who was there. And like, during the the boom period of the 80s and the boom period of the 90s, he was just always around. But not like doing anything, you know what I'm saying? But he was always there. And then when it was... But then it was, when it was over, it was like, he always found a way. I mean, he wasn't like, you know, probably making millions or anything close to that. But, like, he always found a way to capitalize on what fame he developed in the 80s and 90s. And, yeah, everyone, you know, they make fun of the picture, wrestling superstar Virgil or everything like that. But but that's part of it. He worked that, too. But my point is, like, you know, that picture thing. of him all by himself and nobody there, it's like, you know, you can get a picture of anybody doing that at some point. <laughs> I mean, for crying out loud, people take all the pictures, you know, let's go to, I saw pictures from, um, you know, somebody on, on Twitter was, they, they took a photo of the Australia WWE show, which had like 50,000 people in the stadium, but they took it in such a way that like the floor looked totally empty. (laughs) And it's like, dude, there were 50,000 people in the building. Like they got to shoot the pyro from somewhere. And unless you want to shoot that pyro from like under your butt <laughs> on your seat, like there's got to be a bunch of empty space. It's just how they fit. They Like, what are we doing here? Or, hey, you know, one time I went to a, an AW pay-per-view and I was I was sitting, uh, I guess it would have been opposite the hard cam. So I took a picture of whatever was in the ring, and, like, you could see the empty area because that's where they put the hard cam. They do it for WWE. They do it for AW. And, like, you could see empty seats, and people were like, oh, there's nobody there. (laughs) It's like, there's 13,000 people in the building. What are you talking about? So, yeah, of course you could find some pictures of Virgil with nobody there. But there were lots of days where he was there, and he had a crowd, and he sold gimmicks. and Exactly. Good for him. Signing pictures of him sitting there empty and alone. Great. That's the whole thing. And you know what? Unlike a lot of guys, Brian, and maybe... My memory could be poor about this, but look how many guys after WCW closed and ROH became a thing. We saw all of those shoot videos come out. We saw all the shoot interviews where essentially some guys were very truthful about it. And other guys, if you just paid them enough and gave them some gimmicks and sat them down, they would tell you anything and he actually stayed out on the scene and was able to acquire money and was able to keep his name out there not doing those. Like, he seems to be the one guy. I mean, even Shawn Michaels did an RF shoot video. I mean, there were so many people that did them. I don't remember Mike Jones, Soul Train Jones, Virgil, ever doing one of those. So maybe he did, but he didn't have to live off them like a lot of people do. He just went out every weekend and sold his gimmicks, did his thing, told his Olive Garden breadstick story. Oh, hey, Sandman's got a story. You want no story? Yeah. Sandman here says, the guy basically saw me at a convention, told me to come over to him. I did, and we chatted. He saw my WWE encyclopedia and said, I have three photos in there. 
I will sign your book for 30 bucks or something like that. I love it. And he would not give back my encyclopedia till I agreed. <laughs> A uh, Carney's Carney. Somebody said it was a Lucha Gato. Somebody said it earlier in the chat and everything. Look, just a, a natural hustler going out there, living off his name, and I, I don't think hurting anybody in the process. And I think that's another thing. Well, too, I mean, he hurt Sandman's checkbook here, but well, I mean, he, he did, it's just a I little guess. thing. You were at a convention. You knew you were going to spend money, brother. Well, look, and look how many wrestlers out there have, you know, on the independent scene, you know, have come across Virgil because he was out every weekend as people were on their rises and on their descents again throughout their career. You know, he's a guy that's always kind of been there doing these conventions and doing all this stuff. So, again, sad goes way too early. I, I didn't expect this. I mean, he is so young. And yeah, it's that sad that, it's, it's, it, that, that that's happened. But I tell you... You know, you want to talk about, hey, you weren't the champion of the world or anything like that. I don't know what the dude did with his money. Maybe he really needed to be out there hustling. Maybe he just wanted to be near his friends and part of the action. You know, I, I don't know. But what I do know is you can be successful in this profession and never be the world heavyweight champion, never main event pay-per-views, never have a four- or five-star match. But you can be there getting that check and being, again, keeping your name in for so long, even if it was ridiculous that he became Vincent and that he became Shane and he became Wild Curly Bill or whatever it was. Like, that is ridiculous. But, hey, a 20-year wrestling career is a 20-year wrestling career. And Sandman goes, and the next day, try to do it again. After my friend <laughs> said he had no money for an autograph, he turned to me and said, if you buy one more, I'll sign his for free. <laughs> I looked and said, no, you already got three off me. He says, I learned my lesson. He tried it the second day. <laughs> yeah, I got to say, like, you know, there's a lot of horrible carny things wrapped around pro wrestling. But there's also some largely harmless carny things that uh, I still laugh at to this day. It's a carny business. I'm sorry. Look, it's, it's three-card Monty. I mean, honestly, there are some... You learn your lesson as a fan. You learn your lesson out there walking the street, you know, when you what person to stop by and maybe what person not to in some cases because they'll wrap you up with their with their rap and Virgil could do that to people, I guess. We also got a lot of other news. If you have Virgil stories, you're welcome to send to me, four two five seven eight zero seven five six six via text message or email me. Uh at four W online at gmail dot com. We now know the financial terms of WWE and MLW's antitrust lawsuit settlement. In January 2022, MLW filed a lawsuit accusing WWE of pressuring third parties to abandon contracts, prospective relationships with them. Lawsuit centered around potential deals with Vice TV and streaming service Tubi that MLW claimed WWE interfered with. They reached a settlement in December 2023. Financial details were not disclosed at the time, but they were made public in TKO's Group Holdings 2023 business report that was released on Tuesday. The report reveals that WWE agreed to pay $20 million for the settlement. For the 12-month period ending December 31, the company's consolidated pre-tax results included $34.2 million in costs related to certain litigation matters at UFC and WWE, including the impact of a $20 million charge related to the settlement of an antitrust lawsuit at WWE. Reconciliation of adjusted, anyway, blah, blah, blah. But I had people, like, texting me yesterday, oh, my God, $20 million. And, you know, the funny thing about it is, like, from the MLW side, holy smokes, they made out $20 million. Which, if I were court, I mean, well, there could be a lot of people asking for money after that one. Might be an but, on that. But at the same time, and obviously, well, they have to pay legal fees and everything. But I'm, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, that's probably a lot of money for for MLW, but for TKL, ain't nothing. A doop. drop in the bucket, man. Drop in the bucket. Mm-hmm. So, really, like. In in you know relativity, you know Einstein. They both made out great, right? Yeah. We'll talk more about it after the break. Observer Live. Sixteen when I first started training, um, 
I think it's a lot more common here in the UK to start so young. Whenever I talk to Americans, they're always a bit shocked by it. But most <laughs> of the people that wrestle in the UK have been doing it since they were very young. Um, but yeah, I started um, I started in a little town called Gloucester, which is where my parents lived. Um, and then I found my school in Cardiff, where I live now in Wales, um, called New Wave Wrestling. And I kind of like grew into myself there. Um, but obviously, it's a very little country, so... We have to do a lot of kind of, if I could get big here, I can move across and I can get big somewhere else. And um, it just kind of snowballed very quickly um, into obviously NXT UK and then here. Like, I feel like it's all happened really fast and I have to kind of stop myself and be grateful and take it all in sometimes. So I, um, I actually got interested in quite late, I guess, as a kid. I think I was only maybe 14 when I first started watching it. Um, so the turnaround between me watching it and deciding I wanted to do it was pretty small. Um, but my older brother was like obsessed with wrestling and he's 10 years older than me and he'd always kind of stay up and watch the pay-per-views. And I remember one day I was just off work, uh, off school, sorry, um, sick. And I was in the living room just sleeping and he came down and he was like, oh, can I watch the wrestling? Because obviously it's on at like 3 a.m. here in the UK. Um, so he came down and asked to watch it and I was like, yeah, sure, I don't care. And I think it was like an elimination chamber. Um, but I remember just seeing it and then being glued. And from that day, I literally stayed up with him every Monday night before school on the Tuesday and watched it with him. Um, and then I don't know, that very quickly became me just Googling wrestling school. Um, and I literally went to the first one that came up. There happened to be one about 10 minutes from my house, which was very lucky. Um, but yeah, I just kind of it was one of those things that it's such a strange thing to go and do that I didn't really feel like I could pre prepare too much for it. Um, the only thing I really knew what to do was to go to the gym. So that's how I ended up being really strong <laughs> because I was like, well, wrestlers are strong. So that's just what I did first. Um, and then, yeah, I just kind of turned up and obviously being so young, it was quite intimidating, but it was very, it was quickly alleviated by the fact that there were so many more young people there than old people. Like, I guess there was just an influx of people of sort of my generation that kind of realized, oh, we can just start. We can just do this. And even if you don't do shows for a few years, at least you're getting your feet in there, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's a pretty, um, pretty weird place to grow up, I guess, to kind of become an adult around wrestling is always interesting. But um, it's always been very good to me and I've never had any bad times growing up for it. You know, there's a big thread on our board about the Observer Awards. Oh, boy. And best Booker and et cetera, et cetera. Best I ever. urge you all to not go in there, okay? But <laughs> foolishly, I did on my vacation. Oh, no. And, you know, there were people that were arguing that the only reason that WWE's more successful now than they were a couple of years ago was because they went to Peacock, and now everybody can get the shows for, like, four ninety nine. Oh, come on. And listen, obviously, they have more people watching their pay-per-views than ever because of Peacock. That is absolutely true, okay? That's absolutely true. But that is not the reason that they're more successful than ever. And I bring that up because in the TKO Group Holdings report here, about a UFC pay-per-view lately? They're not no. four ninety nine. No, they're not. They're not nine ninety nine. They're not the uh, forty nine ninety nine that uh, AEW charges. And by the way, they're still doing their normal hundred forty thousand usually. Their pay per views are like, I don't even know because I haven't bought one forever. But I think they're like seventy four ninety nine, seventy nine ninety nine or something like that. Plus, you have to have ESPN. Plus. Exactly. So, so if you want to buy the pay per views, you're shelling out almost a hundred dollars a month for the UFC pay per views. Okay. Mm -hmm. UFC. 
delivered record financial results. Revenue increased 13% to $1.3 billion. Adjusted EBITDA up to $756 million. UFC live events up 34% to a record $168 million. UFC held 43 events, generated significant viewership gains, set all-time records for gross revenue. UFC sponsorship increased 18% to a record $196 million. New brand partners, renewal increases. The point is, these pay-per-views are more expensive than ever. And meanwhile, and for those of you that have been watching UFC for a long time, and I've been watching since 93... Although I don't watch much lately. But, you know, remember the glory period and Ultimate Fighter and the mid-2000s. And, bro, they're destroying those numbers. This is the hottest UFC has ever, ever been. And they're expecting you to shell out almost $100 a month. So, yeah, Peacock helped with viewership. But that is not why WWE is where they are today. Everything being cheaper. They also noticed, uh, noted that uh, WWE revenue is up $1.326 billion, up from $1.292 billion. Increase in live event revenue, media rights, sponsorship revenue. There was a decrease in consumer product licensing, however. Their uh, EBITDA increased 4% to $533 million. Overall, corporate adjusted EBITDA was, uh, well, anyway, they lost uh, $16.5 million, primarily due to an increase in personnel costs, including TKO executive compensation. Uh, site fees were a key growth area for the company, noting the site fees at Elimination Chamber in Perth generated. Still working on securing a home for Raw. After the USA Network deal ends, but before the deal with Netflix begins. So they still have three months where they don't have a television home for Monday Night Raw. Mark Shakir, uh, Shapiro made a point mentioning no one should assume any dollar amounts regarding rights fees for Raw in late 2024. But he's confident the show will air during the window of time between USA and Netflix. <laughs> Let's see... Regarding the UFC antitrust lawsuit set for April, they believe they have the facts on their side, but would not comment further, nor would you expect them to comment. And there was a question of whether Netflix having international rights to WWE content would prevent WWE from developing brands such as NXT Europe. Nick Khan said the deal does not prevent them from creating brands in international markets, although Netflix would get first look rights for the content period. Tell you what, I wonder if that then casts any shadow over the only real piece that they have left in the next coming several years when it comes to bringing in more revenue, and that is the WWE Network. Does now Netflix have first right of refusal if this thing goes up and does Peacock then have to actually stand aside? And that's going to be interesting, I guess, to see. Does WWE truly want to jump in bed with Netflix? Because that was going to be the thing with Apple. If you get in bed with Apple, they have got you globally, worldwide. I think that is a Disney thing that they tend to like as well, too. But, you know, it'll be interesting to see where that lands and, and how much money it gets. And I still think that that's where... If nothing, if no deal is reached where there's going to be an extension, I have a feeling ultimately that's where Raw is going to end up before it officially ends up on Netflix full time. Raw on Monday, 1.74 million viewers, 0. 0.57, 18 to 49, would be considered a mild disappointment. Usually they perform better coming off a of pay per view, but they did not. Still first on cable by a wide margin. USA, the number one rated television station over the three hours. The main event segment with Rhodes and Grayson Waller and the Rhodes-Heyman confrontation did 1.60 million viewers, which is strong considering what the rest of the show did. Cody's drawn. He is drawing. But that segment was freaking weird. By the way, 
should mention very quickly that uh, we have not been doing the full TV reports here on this program because I do full TV reports on other programs and I don't need to repeat myself all day. If you want the full Raw report, the full NXT report, the full Dynamite report, Rampage, actually I don't do Rampage, Collision and pay-per-views, your options are you can either listen to the reviews on the subscriber-only shows, or if you are a subscriber, we now are, I don't know if you guys have noticed or not, hopefully you have, you're a subscriber, Dave is, is putting out exclusive news stories uh, that are behind a paywall for subscribers. He had the one about Tamatangi yesterday. And we are now putting all of my TV reports behind that paywall as well. So wow. if you want the full NXT report, and I've I've expanded them greatly of late. I, uh, I've got a lot of notes in there. But you can go check them out as a subscriber at WrestlingObserver.com. Ron NXT are up, and I'll have Dynamite up later on tonight. I'm looking at this right now. I am caught in a uh, a weird time warp here. I opened up a little earlier on today this story about 19 CMLL stars in danger of losing U.S. work visas, and I just opened up another page, and the font is completely different. We have changed over at at, at the website, F4WOnline.com, a new sleeker look. What? Yeah. We have? Look at it. The CMLL stars? No, we're not, look at the front page now. we got all new graphics and everything. What are you looking at, dude? Look. Look, hold on here. I'm looking at the exact same site I've always seen. Hold on. See? Look. See this? You see this? It's like the old font and everything here you got going on here. Now here, you got the new font and everything going on here. See What's that? that tab up there? Porn? That is not porn. There's no porn up there on those tabs, is there? Got to clean I, the screen, I though. honestly have no idea what you're what you're looking at. What really? did you click to get that? I don't. I just clicked the front page, and it looks like there's all new, all new font up there. Mine is exactly the same as it's always been. Very USA Today ish, I think. I don't know. Although, if that, you go but... into the uh, newsletters area, it's different. See, I'm telling you, things change. That's a newsletter area, you idiot. I'm talking about the main front page. Looks exactly the same to me. Well, did you just see what I just showed you? Yeah, I don't know what. You're Obviously, at. it's different then, huh? What the hell's going on around here? What do you got going on? I don't know. It's a mystery. I mean, we listen, we are, we have got... Uh, I shouldn't even talk about this. I would say sometimes you think it's a gimmick that Brian has no idea what's going no, on. No, Brian Rhodes here. Side. Brian Rhodes here. I don't believe there have been any major changes. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know what's so, going on with your thing. Why, but, why hey, is, listen. Why is the font completely different on one than the other? Listen. I don't, I don't get it. I know... Uh, there is a font change, Jingu says. Yeah, the hmm. newsletter area has a different font. But, but not the, the front, front page. page. But the front... What, then what is this? I don't then know. I don't know why it looks like that. I don't have any idea why it looks like that. Hmm. All right. Let's stop wasting time. But I will say... <laughs> oh, yeah. Now we're going to do that. I will say we have some big changes coming that we've been working on for, like, almost a year. And at this rate, probably we'll be working on almost for another year. <laughs> but... uh you know, glacial slow change. Because you know what people don't like is rapid, abrupt change. They don't. But after this slow change, it could be rather abrupt. Who knows? <laughs> anyway. If you guys think I'm not talking about NXT, well, oh, I boy. will. Oh, but, which, before you do that. Well, hold on. Just, I'm not getting there yet. I got news. Good. Well, first we should mention that Dynamite Tonight, we now have six segments. We got Sting making his final Dynamite appearance before retirement. In other words, he's going to be on the show. Although, after his retirement, we will not be seeing him every week. But I'm sure he will be back here and there. We got BCC versus Eddie Kingston and FTR. An appearance from Will Ospreay. Chris Jericho will be facing Atlantis Jr. With Atlantis. (laughs) What? Yes. The hell did that come from? I was going to say, we couldn't hear about this beforehand. Yeah, maybe that would have been important to advertise in advance. I might have bought a ticket for that, but too late now. Chris Statlander versus Sky Blue. And Hangman Page will announce his status for Revolution. So as we talked about last week, well, I'll talk about it after the break. Because it's called a cliffhanger. Back in a moment, Observer Live.
Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. I figured it out. What's that? It's it's different if you're a subscriber as compared to a, a non-subscriber. Like, we give you everything up there if you're a non-subscriber, but if you click in as a subscriber, it gets a lot sleeker, it gets a lot easier to use, and it's a lot more quality for your dollars is what's going on there. That's what I figured out. Well, let me log into my own site, find out if that's true. All right. Okay, I know my membership information, brah. But how do I get back to the front page? I don't even know how to use my own site. <laughs> okay, there we are. It looks exactly the same to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Will you shut up for a second? Last week, Hangman Page, for those of you who don't recall, did a match, did a flip, and sold his ankle, got out, and we never saw... Actually, we did see him again. He was laying on the ground screaming at a cameraman to not film him as he grabbed his ankle. <laughs> and screamed loudly to ringsiders that he thought that his ankle was broken. And then he very quickly got out of there. And, you know, that night, you know, as I asked people what was going on, I mean, they didn't know. They thought he was hurt. And it turns out he was not hurt. He, uh, I want to make sure I don't say that he shot his own angle because I don't know. I presume that he talked about this with Tony. But regardless, he sold a potentially broken ankle because he had a personal situation that uh, that may have resulted in him having to miss the pay-per-view. And so he wasn't sure if he's going to make the pay-per-view or not. So he did the injury angle to, uh, you know, have a cover story if he, if he ended up not being able to make the pay-per-view. An exit valve. So uh, they have now announced that Hangman will announce his status for Revolution. And I don't know, I want to make this clear, I don't know what he is going to say, okay? But I did get the impression that people believe he's going to make the pay-per-view. Everything's going to work out. So that could change. I mean, he may announce my ankle, I mean, he could say, my ankle's really bad. I'm going to do everything in my power to be there. But I think with AEW, like they usually, they, they don't want to false advertise or, or promise something that may not happen. So the fact that they said he's going to announce it, I think he's going to either say today I'm there or I'm not. And my guess is he's going to say that he's going to be there. So we'll find out tonight. But that's the story on, on Hangman Page. And, and you might as well tease it. Tease it for the show. Make it a reason for people to tune in, or at least add to the reasons that you want people to tune in. So, good. And, and hopefully, whatever it is that, that caused the need to try to put in this exit valve, whatever it is, hopefully it's it's all good on his end. I think my nose is bleeding. <laughs> really? Anything is else? Dry in, is it dry in there? Uh, maybe in this room. Oof, man. Any blood? Oh, man. All right, several you wrestlers. You could have an angle there. You could have pulled up like this, like Paisley, no! Oh, come on. I'm trying to plug my nose and give you a chance to talk about something, but I guess I just have to keep going. No, I mean, the old days of doing cocaine, that would happen all the time. That's usually something that would happen, you know? That would be the look if you're looking at Brian right now. If you're you're watching this on video, tilt it up with his nose like that. You know, he used to bang a line, put a little water up there. Make sure you got it all. You know, make sure you got all of the value for your money. Like a subscriber at F4W. All right, right that's enough. We're killing the people. <laughs> According to a report from PW Insider, the U.S. government is in the process of canceling the work visas for several luchadors, including those who have recently performed on AEW programming. According to a post from Lucha Blog, Soberano Jr., Templario, Volador Jr., Echicero, Blue Panther, and Mascara Dorado, uh, Dorada are among those believed to be losing their work visas. And uh, several others in danger of having their visas canceled as well. Breakdown said, the situation said to be due to a breakdown of communication between CMLL and the American indie full-blown pro wrestling out of Texas who had been sponsoring the visas. Full-blown owner Jerry Cadena was contacted by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security regarding the visa applications. They informed him of an issue related to the visas, although it's not clear what the issue is. Homeland Security also informed Cadena that he could be accused of fraud oh. if the issue caused by visa applications to be flagged. CMLL then informed him they would handle the situation 
However, he has not heard back from CMLL since. Welcome to working with various promotions. Really? He has now informed Homeland Security he is no longer working with CMLL, and any agreements he had with talent have been terminated as of today, February 28th. Shame on everybody. Shame on everybody involved in this for not getting this thing done and getting people over and dotting I's and crossing T's. Completely ridiculous. And I understand that when you work with CMLL, AAA, a lot of different promotions in Mexico, there are a lot of issues and a lot of headaches that you have to deal with and all that sort of stuff. But this is, you know, on the Texas end of things, on the American end of things, you're bringing these guys in for a huge weekend, not only for them, but for the fans as well, too. You know, you're putting on this big show, WrestleMania weekend, and it's going to be a big deal. And then, you know, this goes and happens. It's just... This is really, really a frustrating thing. And, you know, if CML, and again, we'll have to see. I mean, they said that they would handle the situation. Now, Kadena hasn't heard back from the promotion. I mean, it's just, this is all really frustrating. And who pays the price on this? Obviously, the talent, and it cuts a hole into their pocket with the money they thought they were going to make. But it is also a spit in the face to the fans that were hoping that they were going to be there. So, that's really, a, again, a, a, a nasty situation. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on it or Well, not, the one thing I sucks. will say is, yes, this absolutely sucks. But I will say that um, I will say that at least they'll have plenty of work in Mexico. I mean, I've seen visa issues where people in Canada have visa issues and can't go work elsewhere. And... It's like, what are you going to do in Canada? Like, there's some shows that you can do, but it's like, you're yeah, but- you're greatly restricted as to what you can actually do to work if you can't get out of Canada. Whereas, you know, if you can't get into America to work, it's like, you're not going to make as much money. I mean, I'm sure that, that AEW is going to pay them, you know, probably better than it would make for some random mini show in Mexico. Well, that's but, like, the thing you is, can at least do some work. You can, but, I mean, the American dollar compared to that peso, selling your gimmicks at American prices as opposed to, you know, again, because, again, with all the bootlegs and everything else, you already have an issue with, with selling merchandise down there. You kind of throw your hands up. But, like, the stuff that you're taking in, you're selling at American prices. You're getting dollars for them. And th- if this has got any effect on what could happen during Mania weekend, because if anybody was relying on that, I mean, I don't know. So it's just – it that sucks. I mean, it absolutely stinks. One thing that I wanted to say, too, because I was going to uh, bring this up when you were talking about – what WWE and TKO wanted us to know about how much money they made is that they are trying to prevent us from finding out some other money that they may have made. And they filed a complaint, according to Russell Knox, oh, yes. yesterday on February 16th. And I don't know if you want to get into this story or not, but, you know, they are suing the Texas Attorney General to prevent the agreement of their to the release of the agreement that they had with the city of San Antonio to bring the Royal Rumble there. And it just blows my mind that they are claiming that it would break trade secrets. And there is, you know, information in there that is completely, it can't make it out. I'm sorry. You're a publicly that, traded that is company. A pretty, uh, that is a pretty serious... I mean, you're, it's a publicly traded company. This is the money, though, of the state of Texas. Even on WWE side, if they want to try to hide this or obfuscate it somehow when it comes to their filings, okay, fine. But as a shareholder, I still would probably want to know how much you're getting out of this. And on the flip side, if I'm a resident of Texas and a uh, Den- Denzian of, of San Antonio, I kind of want to know how much I had to pay for this especially if i'm not a wrestling fan and didn't care about the event being here well my presumption is the actual reason that they don't want it out would be i guess an analogy would be uh, let's say that uh and i'll use court bauer actually because you just made 20 million (laughs) dollars okay let's say that uh you know somebody wants to know what did you uh you know what are you paying uh whoever uh fatu and of course, like I'm going to tell you, I'm paying Fat Two because let's say he's paying Fat Two a lot of money. Well, you find out he's paying Fat Two a lot of money, and then all of a sudden, well, you want a lot of money. Yeah. So I would presume the reason they don't want that out is because they're trying to get all these cities to bid. I get and so that. if they gave them like a great deal, and it's like we don't want that out that we get to them for X amount. Like we want to get X amount, but the way that they worded it 
makes it sound like what were you doing for this site fee? Like, but that's the that's thing weird. Is, site fees have been public for a long time anyway. I mean, it's not like site fees were. I mean, a lot of times that would judge like the beginning of a promotion of a fight. Did the Hilton compared to Trump Castle pay one point five million dollars to have this fight here? And if there were people that weren't bidding, it's like okay, that was kind of a bellwether on. All right, how's the promotion of this fight going to go? So, it, I, to me, I, it is shady, and I get it from WWE side in some ways about it being proprietary or whatever, not wanting it out there. But the bottom line is, the, if if nothing else, on the flip side of that, when it's money that's coming from a state, and you should be that type of thing has got to be at some point or another during the fiscal year that has got to be reported and put out to the public because again it's their tax money that's being used for this and this happens with super bowls with concerts with we're seeing it in virginia uh with the possibility of ted leonsis wanting to move the capitals and the wizards there that like there are people that don't care about this stuff they don't want it and they don't want any of their money spent on it so uh, this is going to be an interesting little fight to see how this goes all right here are the big notes from nxt i didn't really like the show at all <laughs> there was exactly one good match on the show which was the heritage cup match with noam dar and charlie dempsey that was actually a great match and that was it. We have three of the dumbest angles in all of pro wrestling going on in NXT at the same time. My favorite show. Three of the dumbest angles in all of wrestling. You've got the angle where Dijak has his own personal dungeon with a padded room where he kidnaps people against their will and puts them in a straitjacket. That's stupid. We have got the uh, Lyra and, uh, and, pay and what's her name? Tatum, pa Tatum Paxley. Paxley, which is just beyond stupid. And I'd need hours to talk about how stupid that one is. But I'll actually tell you the short version right now. It's 2024, and they are doing a storyline where one person is aggressively trying to hook up with another person. The other person doesn't want it, but the, other, the first person keeps pushing, pushing. And that person's supposed to be a babyface. Not to mention how hideous the acting is. I mean, this storyline absolutely sucks. And now they've added a new storyline, which actually is so stupid that it might grow on me, okay? Miss NXT, Ariana Grace, okay? <laughs> She's been here for months. She's been a wrestler. All of a sudden this week, her gimmick is she doesn't understand why all the people in NXT want to fight each other. We shouldn't be fighting. Well. <laughs> we have a character who doesn't understand why the professional wrestlers are wrestling each other. She wants them to stop wrestling each other. And she is a wrestler. That is one for the ages. Now, we will talk about the main event angle quickly when we get back. Observer Live. Oh, it was so cool. It was, it was terrifying more than anything. Um, I almost wish... I fell off right at the end. And I almost wish I'd have fallen off earlier on. Because at least it would have been done and it would have been out of my system. But the fear of falling off of that thing is so much worse than actually falling off of it. Um, but it, it was it was so cool. Like the amount of things you can do in a match like that. If you think of all the things you can do in a match, and then you add six other people, and then you add this huge structure that you can all hang off of. You know, like there's just so many ways to get around it and. Obviously, I was sharing it with some incredible women, too. Um, lots of women that I'd never even wrestled before. So that was a whole thing in itself. Um, but yeah, it was crazy. It was it was a great time. But I reckon I, I'd like to do another one, but maybe not loads of them. <laughs> yeah, it is cool. I guess that match was such a, especially it being the first TNA pay-per-view um, in a long time. It, there was a lot of eyes on that show. And obviously, we were the first the first match on the show. So it did really kind of throw me into the deep end a little bit of so many people that might not have even been watching 
um, TNA at the time had tuned in because this was the first pay-per-view back and then I'm one of the first people they see and they might not have even ever heard of me. So it was a really nice way, I think, and a really good showcase for me to kind of show what I'm all about in like a really exciting way as opposed to just being, you know, brought on on TV, which would have been great, but it was so exciting to do it, you know, in Vegas, on live pay-per-view, like there was so many cool things about it. Yeah, it's great. I think it's really kind of exactly what I needed at this point in my career. Obviously, like you said, I was in NXT UK a bit, um, but I was even younger when I was there. I was about 19 when I signed, so it's a lot to handle at a very young age. Um, and then I had a year or two out just doing the independence like throughout the UK and then coming over to Canada and we started doing stuff with Impact at the time. Um, it really helped kind of, I think, level me up as much as obviously I'd been in WWE and that was really cool. I don't think I was necessarily ready for that sort of stage at my age and my experience level, you know, but it gave me so many tools that I think now I can bring to somewhere like TNA where I'm a bit more grown up, a bit more experienced and a lot more prepared for it. Um, so I really think it's like the perfect place for me to be right now um, to kind of show the rest of the world what, say, here in the UK, everybody else already knows. Um, so it's nice to be able to share it and get a bit more kind of like uh, international notoriety, I suppose. It was crazy. Like, obviously, we'd done a little bit with them with subculture. Um, so it wasn't out of nowhere, but it was very much like, OK, like, they understand what I'm trying to put out into the world. And I think that's the biggest thing I've got from it is that there's a lot of trust in someone giving you a job like that. You know, it's them going, we know that you know what you're doing and we want to help you get there. So I don't really want to make a... I don't want to bury it till I see what they do, but... I will say I thought it was so simple going to WrestleMania. And that is that Mello faces Elia next week on Roadblock. Mello wins the title. Trick returns. You do Trick versus Mello for the title at Mania. And Trick wins the belt. That's the easiest thing. The other option is... Well... Mello goes for the title. Trick costs him the title. And then you do Trick versus Mello with no title on the line. Yeah. Which you can do. And Tony D against Ilya. That well, that's that's did? what they did. They 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 totally changed it up. So Tony D is now in the title picture. Next week at Roadblock, it is Tony D versus Carmelo Hayes. The winner gets Ilya. And so my presumption is Trick is going to screw Carmelo out of that match. And then we have Trick versus Mello and Elia versus Tony D for the title over Mini Weekend, which is fine. I, I, yeah. I mean, Tony D is great, but I, I just, you know, the NXT title, I mean this with all due respect, it doesn't freaking matter. And Trick is so over. He's the most over guy on the show by far. There is no reason that he can't win that title and be the NXT champion. Hold on. The fans out. want it. I'll tell you why. Because you Do know it. what they want to see more than that? Uh, some awesome match where there's probably a lot of plunder involved, and at the end it's Trick standing over Mello, and then regardless of if Tony D'Elia or anybody else has that title, at some point, here we go after Mania, now we have the true build of Trick to that title for this year. And maybe you don't want him to take it off Ilya. Maybe you want it to be off of a D'Angelo or, or somebody like that. We'll see. Well, he'd be taking it off Carmelo, which is the best of all worlds. I I don't believe so. Uh, why do we have to I'll argue about something? I don't think it matters. Of course it does. It's Trick and Carmelo. It's a three-year feud. Maybe more. I'm out of here. Seen it out with Lance. Observer Live. <laughs>